Melissa Rosenberg, the critic at Think Progress and a columnist at Slate in the Atlantic, and welcome back to Critic Proof, where this week I have uh, one of my favorite people to talk about pop culture with on, um, and she is... Mo Ryan, from Huffington Post TV. Um, and we're here today to talk mostly about uh, Sons of Anarchy, which finishes... Uh, it's fifth season. I can't believe it's been going for five seasons and that we're apparently getting two more to come. Um, uh, finished last night, and uh, that was an insane episode of television. Um, it was. I don't know. It was. I, I, I have a feeling uh, what what scene will most stand out for, I don't know, if for you, but for me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Why don't we talk about that first? Because... Uh, Everyone's going to be talking about it. So basically, Otto Delaney, the uh, gang leader who uh, has been in jail for a long time, has been sort of caught up in a bunch of the pop machinations on Sons, which is about this motorcycle gang, uh, bit off his own tongue rather than testify uh, against the club. And it was one of the grossest things I've ever seen on television. Like, I don't want us to talk about it in visceral detail because I've been right. having dry heaps since I saw it. Yeah. Um, but I actually thought it was... As gross as it was, I thought it was one of the most sort of justifiable scenes of extreme violence that I've seen on television in a while, if only because, um, so Otto is played by Sons of Anarchy series creator Kurt Sutter, and his character has basically been going through this process of like extreme self-mortification. Like he's right. lost one of his eyes in prison, he gets beat up, he, you know, has been sort of constantly physically degraded. and. Sutter is someone who's gotten himself into a lot of trouble on Twitter and elsewhere by talking too much. And right. to, so it, to have his character literally bite off his own tongue and remove his ability to speak, right. I actually thought was like a really interesting meta moment on the show. Yeah, I think really Otto's treatment is one of the ways in which the show makes itself most clear. And, you know, um, if people are... I've written a lot about the show. Certainly you have written even more, I think. Um, and I just recorded a podcast last night with a mutual friend of ours, Ryan McGee, on this very subject. And I think that Sun sometimes gets in its own way in terms of just having so much plot that it sort of obscures other stuff. But with Otto, it's been strangely um, kind of unified. And I think it kind of helps that we don't see Otto all the time. He's not mega involved in every aspect of the you know the Sun's plots because obviously Kurt Sutter can't be on screen that much, but there's been a real consistency with how they've portrayed him in that he's been consistently sort of, sort of abused and used and uh, his agency removed. And it's, it's, it's interesting to me that, that that's, the, <laughs> that's a metaphor that I actually, Kurt Sutter, I think, he, there's so much the show is about the difficulty of connection, and I think that through Otto, uh, Kurt Sutter is exploring that issue in these really concise moments and certainly we've seen Otto blind in one eye nearly blind in the other eye beaten, hurt, and now um, deprives himself of the ability to speak because everyone wants to use his words for their own purposes so again I think there's kind of an interesting <laughs> I can't believe I'm about to say this but I think there's a kind of elegance in how they treated Otto um, because this is a show that can kind of being, bring these big bags of baggage of plot behind it and, and get sort of overly involved with these, I think, two, two elaborate plots that just sort of slow, slow things down. But in, with the case of Otto, it, it's sort of a really nicely concentrated, distilled essence of what Sons is about. Well, and I also think that it's a show... I mean, I think I, until you started talking about this, I don't think I'd realize this. But one of the things that actually distinguishes Sons for me from other sort of anti-hero television shows mm -hmm. is that Otto, in certain ways, is playing the role that wives do on other television shows, right? And there's all this sort of hatred for anti-hero wives, like Skylar White right. is a bitch because she calls out Walter White on the fact that he's a deranged sociopath when most people right. just want to see him as a badass. Otto is this sort of living, like, tortured, almost mortified in a Catholic sense you know, mm -hmm. testament to the cost of what these, like, sort of badass motorcycle yeah. gang members do, right? Like, he, you know, he's been physically destroyed, his wife has been murdered, um, 
you know, in a sort of collateral damage for Sun's business. He is in prison. Um, and he Even is in prison, this, he can't get any peace because people want to use him and, and employ his, you know, thoughts or recollections for specific purposes that have nothing to do really with him. Right. And so, you know, he's someone who is just this testament to the damage that the sort of mm -hmm. badass masculine subculture inflicts on everyone it comes into touch with. But he's just like, he is, it is physically disgusting, right? He has this mm -hmm. externalization of this masculinist damage. And that's right. actually like a really shocking and different thing for one of these anti-hero shows to do. Like men die in other shows, but yeah. you know, Otto is almost like crucified for the sons. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons the show has resonance. Um, I, I, th I think a lot about this idea that I call stealth shows, which, you know, um, okay, it's a mobster drama, but we're going to put it, you know, it's really, it, it seems like a mobster drama, but it's really about existential despair mm -hmm. and self-absorbed, self um, you know, people who are unable to resist their narcissistic impulses in their selfishness and that kind of thing. So it, it, it the Sopranos was a huge, broad success because it tapped into very recognizable archetypes and tropes and ideas, and there were whackings mm -hmm. and stuff. But in the, sa in the same way, I think Sons of Anarchy is about loneliness, and specifically, you know, you've written a lot about this, about this idea that um, what is the idea of masculinity that is presented to these men versus what do they actually need and want and desire. And it's those things that when they're in conflict with each other that I think the show actually works kind of well, you know. Um, I actually, until <laughs> the show made Tara stupid enough to bring Otto across, I actually liked the connection between Otto and Tara in mm -hmm. that weirdly intimate moment that they had. Um, I've liked some scenes with, you know, Bobby trying to talk to Jax as like a friend and a, and a consigliere of people trying to establish these connections, you know, like... Uh, I've had serious issues with the Gemma storyline, but the Nero Gemma story is about two lonely, damaged people who are just trying to find a connection that is not painful. Yeah. And that's, I think, what a lot of the show is kind of centered around. Well, and I wanted to back up for a second, because one of, another one of the things that I think sort of distinguishes Sons is that it's really, it's really close all the time, even if I don't think it consistently achieves it, to having some of the best sort of female characters of this sort of anti-hero age of television and the fact that it's got sort of two adult women at all <laughs> um, who are, you know, are allowed to have sort of big, messy emotions is interesting to me. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Tara, because for me, um, she's the wife of uh, Jax Teller, the leader of the motorcycle gang and sort of the main Hamlet-like character of the show. And you and I have both been sort of frustrated by the ways that Tara, who's this, you know, brilliant surgeon who sort of moves back to her childhood hometown of Charming, gets back together with effectively her high school boyfriend, despite the fact that he, you know, in certain ways is lower class, that he embroils like both her and her family directly in a lot of violence, mm -hmm. um, you know, had just sort of fallen for this guy and, you know, has this sort of, I, you know, my joke has been that, like, it's supposed to be the Ring of Fire, and it's actually just a protect, protracted case of teenage fuck fever, if you'll pardon my language. Um, <laughs> and I actually loved this season for her, because I thought it was a, you know, at the end of the last season, there's this image of Tara and Jax, like, fading into an old photograph of Jax's father and mother. Um, she's sort of taken up this role as the queen, and like, sort of the boss, this, you know, the boss lady of this motorcycle club. Um, and so I thought it was really interesting to see this season her feel like she has a lot of power in the beginning right. and end up by the end of last night's episode really losing all of that. Um, but you thought the, you thought the, her bringing Otto the cross in prison was dumb? I don't know. Tell me it what was dumb. I think this is something that, that's, that's, that Sons does all the time. It undercuts its characters with stupid actions. I mean, I, I think we... I think we have some difference of, differences of opinion, you know, because I think I think Sons is capable of, of excellence. I think it far too often takes shortcuts that make its characters look that undercut my investment in them and undercut my investment in certain developments because I know it's going to be undone. 
I mean, I know that every every year to me, I mean, I, I hate to disagree with you, but I guess, you know, I have to be honest. Um, we're allowed every, to every year ladies. That, we don't have to be polite. <laughs> no, we don't. So we're going to get real. Um, I find that the Tara storyline, I think Maggie Sipp is a great actress. I find Tara's... Um, I find that the actors often have to bring a level of emotional reality and consistency to the characters that isn't there in the overall story or in the script sometimes, yeah. uh, too much of the time. So I find char- that the, the annual Tara's going to go to Charming storyline, almost. I, I almost find it to be self-parody at this point because it happens every year. And it doesn't mm-hmm. happen. She, she doesn't get out because the show needs her to be around. It's like, oh, you know... Uh, Clay has been terrible, and you know he, he uh, a brother would die for all the things he'd done, and then he doesn't die. So that will never happen. You know, I mean, maybe it'll happen on the second to last episode of the entire series. I don't know, but um, so I, I it consistently that- doesn't. I I find that the show fits in the f- women's. I actually find that it, it 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 frustrates me in that it makes a classic mistake of the antihero shows or a classic, you know. Uh, dynamic of the anti-hero shows, the women's story is fit in around that of the men's, and therefore it remains inconsistent and frustrating and, and incomplete in many ways because it's just slotted in in the pieces or in the parts that don't, you know, that aren't occupied by the main narrative. So Tara acts inconsistently all the time. She's just dumb one week and smart the next and savvy one week and not savvy the next. Having a hair pulling fight with Gemma in the garage with some woman she doesn't even know. I mean, that I, I found that really insulting to both the actress and the character. And I just think, again, like the actors really rescue these characters to the point that they can be rescued. But beyond a certain point, um, I find that, you know, often Maggie Siff, and to some degree this season, um, in various seasons, the female characters and other characters, even the supporting characters like some of the guys, have not gotten enough to do or haven't gotten enough that's consistent or consistently interesting um, or just has a through line that makes any damn sense. So this, I mean, I want to come back to that because I think you're right about sort of the amount of space that's allotted to the different characters. Um, Right. The thing that worked for me about Tara this season is that I thought that even more so than sort of Skylar's arc on Breaking Bad, this was a season for Tara that was about her experimenting with being a badass and then like really having to confront the consequences of that. Because what happens sort of with her and Otto is that she goes and sees him in prison and be, uh, to try and get him to recant the testimony that he was going to give that would be key to a RICO case against the Suns. And she convinces herself that she's developed this bond with him. Um, you know, like, he masturbates and cries to her presence. Uh, again, this is, like, a very Kurt Sutter thing to do to himself on screen. Um, she feels really... And she brings him across. I don't think it's because she's stupid. I think it's because she's hubristic. And I do you see those things somewhat differently? I think that she's convinced herself that she's become this sort of key to Otto finding his way back to decency when he's actually sort of embraced being an animal. And right. when he attacks this nurse, I mean, she's not just shocked because she's witnessing a murder that she facilitated like up close and personal and in a really bloody way. She's recognizing that she's been an idiot. Like the show is making her accountable for having been an idiot. And, but that idiocy is not because like she's dumb, it's because she convinced herself that she was Gemma. And I think a lot of this season has been about Tara like putting on um, a sort of the very specific gender identity of being an old lady, right? Like she gets into the fight in part because it happens at a moment when like she and Gemma have a little bit of a reproachment, which no matter how much Tara says she doesn't want or sort of acts like she's too cool for, I, I mean, you know, this is her high school boyfriend. She wants his mom to like her. So I think that a lot of this season for me and what made me effective is that I thought it was Tara confronting that, like, this performance is really artificial and she's not actually up for this at all. Um, To me, one of the most striking seasons in the finale was when Jax's ex-wife, who's a recovering addict, comes and sees Tara and tells her that Jax attacked her and shot her up with a speedball, which he in fact did to try and make her look like, 
she was unfit to reclaim her child. Mm -hmm. And Tara just believes her, right? Like she doesn't say you're lying. She doesn't say they can't be. She doesn't Mm -hmm. suggest that Wendy's like remembering things wrong. She just believes her, like in part because she's kind of seen what these people are. And I thought that was really interesting. It's like a very subtle moment and it's entirely what's not there. But I thought it was really fascinating that like Tara sort of gone through this very systematic bumping up against her own abilities and sort of confrontation with who her husband is. And that's not something that you, I mean, part of what's characterized by these anti-hero shows is women who kind of like back away from that realization. Like Carmela Soprano is absolutely that. Like Sky- Skylar White sees who her husband is, but she doesn't like set into process like her own separation from him. Um, and I guess I, I just, I thought that was interesting. There was more space given to that arc than I've seen in comparable shows. And it hmm. stood out to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I see what you're saying about her putting on, um, you know, sort of a pose of uh, the, old, the, the the manipulative old lady just as um, Gemma is spinning out of control. I just think on a practical level, sounds so often takes the lazy way to a plot point that I have trouble investing myself in, as emotionally and as deeply as I did in, in like, you know, when the show was much earlier in its run. You know, if, if, I felt that like if the show had more faith in me and, and also like in my intelligence or, or belie- yeah. more belief in my intelligence, I would be willing to cut it slack. You know, I always feel like, you know, TV shows have bank accounts of, um, what I'm willing to believe and what mm. I'm willing to sort of yeah. up with. And, you know, um, there's been this huge debate going on about Homeland of like, was this plausible? Was that plausible? You know, Homeland has a lot of money in the bank with me right now. And I'm not saying that it did not make a withdrawal on Sunday, but it, it, it definitely, you know, I still have quite a substantial amount of funds in there. With Sons, um, quite frankly, the end of season four left that show so overdrawn in terms of sheer logic and also mm-hmm. you know you know Kurt Sutter and his writers tend to go into this realm of you know outside puppet masters controlling the club and these bizarre outside motivations like some Irish guy that we've seen on screen for less than four minutes is going to be the arbiter of whether Clay live or, lives or dies and, and, and I, you know all these mechanical reasons feel are, are, are placed into my path so that I mechanic, you know, so that I, I have, there's some defense that, oh, but this is logical. Well, mechanics is not, you know, um, emotional plausibility, if you will, or uh, g- gut feeling, gut instinct plausibility. That's just, that's an explanation. That's not, a, you know, something that is clinically on paper as an explanation for something is not something that's going to make me truly believe and sort of make a deposit in my account of credibility, if you will. So the show consistently um, is inconsistent, you know, and I think that you got to, for me, it's been this constant battle of, well, well, you know, well, you know, put up or shut up. Why are you still watching? <laughs> you know, I, I ask myself that. Well, it's because, you know, there are, when the show just lives with its characters, when the show trusts itself to just sort of inhabit a moment or a scene with people, um, and let them be and let them converse and let them kind of process things, process these feelings of abandonment in, in fear and connection and respite and why those things matter and how they're inextricably bound up with each other. And then you have something just, you know, balls to the wall crazy like um, Walton Gonick Goggins as Venus Van Dam. And, you know, speaking of characters that kind of resonated for me, I really love that they gave that character all the power and all the agency in that scene and it was not a sort of tragic case of a character of that nature, which you often see in culture, in popular culture, that, oh gosh, isn't it terrible to be this person? And, you know, Wong Goggins just kind of owned that scene and brought this really fresh, vital energy to that moment, and it was funny, and it was silly, and it was, you know, over the top, as Sons likes to do, but uh, it gave that person some real dignity and some, um, some real, you know, belief in that person's belief in herself so like well, I, love, what? I love and that I, but, th- but I, that's not saying that the show consistently does that but it does that enough to kind of keep me coming back I guess 
Yeah, well, and I thought part of what was fun about Venus Van Damme, who's a transgender prostitute who shows up in early, earlier in Sons of the Season, is that, like, all of the humor in that see in that sequence she's hired essentially to pose with an enemy of the club and take embarrassing pictures of him is that all the humor emanates from her like all right. of the joke all of the right. jokes in that sequence and, and the men around her really are like desiring her like they're mesmerized by her. really turned on yeah and but it's like what's funny is like their reactions or their insecurity she's having yeah. a ball but it's all about them exactly um, I wanted to go back to what you said about plot mechanics, though. Um, my friend Gabriel Rossman, who's a sociology professor at UCLA, tweeted at me when I said something about the Suns finale. Let me guess. A spaceship lands and aliens insist that Jacks not leave the motorcycle club because they need Galen to sell guns to the cartel. And... <laughs> You know, that strikes me as something that would really happen. Like, it's so, like... This is how FX gets its genre show. <laughs> I, I really feel like at some point, you know, Sons of Anarchy and American Horror Story just going to merge into this big ball of insanity that d demands that you not make any demands of its plausibility. <laughs> so, I don't know, maybe that's the ultimate role model for the future of television. No, but this is something that I think I wrote about a little bit today in a big post about sort of feeling burned out on the intensity of television and that I think has sparked a lot of the debates about Homeland, um, which get, is a show that's critically obsessed over and is sort of the core of the problem with Sons, which has a much higher, which has much higher ratings than Homeland, but for some reason doesn't attract the same sort of sustained critical attention. Which is that? Oh, but I it did, Alyssa. It did for it a did. long time. And sure, just I'm just saying, like, right now, it. right yeah. now, I think both shows have sort of a similar. Both shows have a similar problem, but we the discussion is focusing more on one than the other right now. Anyway, oh, yeah, I, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole, but I think that it's really interesting that shows seem to have decided that we need really, really complex plot mechanisms to say to stay interested. Because, I mean, a whole bunch of sons was eaten up this season about, with a subplot that's about, you know, a CIA agents who are in, who are basically running a Mexican drug cartel and the Irish and gun trading. And I've I'm, always you know, hated all of that, yeah. And I don't, you know, honestly, I have started tuning out for it. Like, I only write about the parts of the show that are emotional or interesting to me right now because, you know, that's what I care about. But... What, part of what freaked me about, out about this most recent episode of Homeland is that it sort of felt like a Suns episode to me. You know, there are so many layers of sort of conspiracy and backdoor planning around this central story about Nicholas Birdie and Carrie Matheson and a couple other people that I'm starting to feel myself like tuning out the action sequences and focusing on the emotional stuff. And for me, that's always a really bad sign for a television show. Well, to me, it's too early to make that, for, for me to make that, you know, sort of deliberation. I think we're only two seasons into Homeland, and um, I have thought from, from the beginning that they're on walking a wire, you know, that they're on a razor's edge and could go either way. But to me... You know, I talked a lot about this in the podcast with Ryan. It's, it's all about, it's not all about, but a lot of it sort of to me centers on what is the intent, what is the effect you're hoping to have short term and long term. So to get to, to get another fight going on Sons, to get another um, action sequence, to get a plot piece in place, the show will just take short term dumb, you know, uh, shortcuts. And mm. long term, that leads to me just tuning it out. So this is a show in its fifth season. I kind of know what it does. I know what it's, it's a very conservative show, honestly, if you think about it, small c conservative, in that it does a certain set number of things, a certain set number of ways, and it doesn't really often take, d diverge from that. And so within that realm of things, um, it has a tendency to be, lazy or sloppy in terms of how it gets you from A to B to C, and then there's mm -hmm. a whole realm of superstructure that is brought in as needed as a, a deus ex machina to just sort of like, you know, make things occur. So that aspect of things, I don't see that ever changing on Sons. That's just how it is. With Homeland, they are attempting a storytelling style that 
is very risky. And I think for me, this was the first episode where there was a, it wasn't just one or two things that were just on the edge of plausibility. There were like five or six things. And I, I respect that. I respect that completely, people who had issues with that stuff. I personally am like still in that position of having a lot of money in the bank with the show, or the show has money in the bank with me. And I'm willing to see where it goes because I think the intent of what they put into place, as Todd Manderworth said it in a really good essay, the intent is to examine how this shakes out with the people in their hearts and minds and souls and careers. You know, and those are a bunch of different things. That's a lot to sort of get at. But, um, and so maybe the show cannot adequately, you know, service all of those different arenas. But to me, the intent that the show has consistently shown has been weird things, crazy things might happen, but it's not a sloppy method of setting some other piece of the plot in motion. It's to get the root of what the show is about, which is, um, you know, lonely people trying to establish connections, trying to establish things that they believe in, uh, whether it's a sort of, uh, a, you know, a set of beliefs or a belief in another person, you know. So it's been, to me, in, in whatever, however many episodes, 20 episodes now, uh, 22, something like that, um, it's been fairly consistent that that's what's interesting in exploring. And I think it is, it was a jarring, it was a jarring way to get us there this past week, but I kind of enjoy being thrown off my game and not knowing what to expect. I fully understand that it might not fully work for a lot of people a lot of the time, but um, I, I have a whole post going up live in a little while about how I still have faith in it, and um, I've fallen down the rabbit hole of the conspiracy theories at this point, which is probably what some people hate, but... Uh, I, I'm going to give the show some credit. I don't think it's... I can't make this judgment that it's like Sons yet because um, Sons, at the end of the second season, I specifically remember a scene, and I'm sure you know the one I'm talking about, where I just was in tears. You know, it was so moving. It was really powerful. And it was something that the show had in a very disciplined way, in a very savvy and smart and yet emotionally powerful way built to Mm. And I yeah. loved that. And maybe that's the sort of storytelling thing that I just personally love. I think since then the show has struggled to regain that kind of consistent emotional involvement on my part because it, I don't know if the, the if the show necessarily trusts itself to play that level of ball. You know, like they, they, there's just I almost feel like the show is frantically throwing things into the pot. Like, well, maybe they won't like that. Maybe I gotta throw this into the pot and that and that and that. And you're like, I don't know, I kinda like the dish how it was, but all right. <laughs> you know? So and I guess this is the thing that is sort of that worries me about Homeland is that you know, I felt I loved the first season because sort of the question and the plot that was leading it towards us was relatively simple. The question is, you know, is Nicholas Brody a terrorist? And right. if so, why is he a terrorist? And the way of getting up there was, will he do this fairly simple thing, right? I mean, you know, it's a three-man operation. Mm -hmm. there the scope him, was not enormous, right? Right. And it wasn't this sort of giant Rube Goldberg device. Like, the emotions were straightforward, and so was the way of getting us there. And I feel like the emotions are still somewhat straightforward in the second season, but I feel like the show feels like it needs to do more complicated things sort of get me there or hype me up and I worry about that you know yeah. I uh, I mean and part I of what I wrote that. about today is that I feel increasingly like shows television doesn't trust me to be interested in people and emotions and you know particularly not in the happy emotions which a lot of prestige drama has just sort of eschewed entirely um, but think about think about things like you know Q&A that episode of Homeland, you know, that was two sure. people talking. And I, I love that the show slowed down to that point and just let that transpire. You know, even, you know, Breaking Bad has had episodes like that where it's just people kind of encountering each other. And I, I agree with you. I, I think if you don't have that as a consistent, you know, area that you're willing to go into, those quieter, more contemplative moments, 
Yeah. Um, I, you can definitely, and that's, but again, I think that's what sons, like you said, you've kind of wandered away from the stuff that doesn't interest you and, and written about the stuff that does. And um, I guess the, the show has proven to me what it's interested in, and, and like, you know, yeah. 60% of it is not that interesting to me. <laughs> but, you know, I like the cast. I just, you know, there's always going to be that laundry list of things that I, sh I wish the show did more of or did better, but, you know, it's a successful show, and there's absolutely no reason for them to want to up their game or change their game based on what, you know, peop what, what someone like me says. Two ladies on the internet talking yeah, about right? Yeah, right? You know, like, <laughs> get right on that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's an interesting challenge, right? Because I, you know... I'm, I guess I'm feeling, and maybe you're feeling this too, I don't know, I'm feeling a real sort of disconnect between myself and American television viewers right now, which I don't like, you know, I want to like things that are popular and be engaged and have things to say with them, but like, I'm having a hard time watching The Walking Dead, for example, I just, you know, last week's episode was too gross for me, um, yeah. and, you know, I... And I feel like I'm sort of missing a register of emotions. I'm burned out on, you know, things being obsessively grim all the time. And, yeah. you know, I think one of the reasons for that is that unlike most people, if I think watch a couple of shows really passionately, I'm watching like 15 shows, um, maybe even more than that. And that's, you know, a lot to keep up on. But, you know, I think we talked about this a little bit during sort of the debate over Game of Thrones and mm -hmm. like, you know, nudity and sexuality part of what kind of burned me out a little, you know, I think one thing that people brought up is, like, there were never any happy, consensual sex scenes in the show, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a show with married couples, with people falling in love, and all of the sex is either bought or brutal. And, right. you know, I mean, Homeland is sort of the weird exception to that, where we have sex scenes between people who are emotionally involved in each other, and they're hot, and they're emotionally engaged, but, you know, but Saul is listening. Yes, <laughs> it's so creepy. And that's really, really unsettling. Yeah, I, you know, I have a number of male mentors, and I hope, dear God, that none of them end up in that position. But, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, there's been this equation of kind of drama with grimness, and, mm -hmm. you know, Sons is absolutely guilty of that, although it did have a wedding this season. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like, drama can be about love and mm -hmm. triumph and mm -hmm. you know it so much of drama right now and what we talk about as sort of prestige drama just seems to me to be about things going wrong all of the time yeah and, and i mean terrible. i wonder if that's why there's so such a renaissance right now in comedy you know i think mm. i think you know the one hour show that mixes comedy with drama like the gilmore girls if you will it's just not it's it's not it's not a thing like at the moment it's not i mean this is why i'm watching arrow this is why I'm watching, you know, I mean, I don't think Nashville has completely found itself yet, but I'm watching um, Nashville, though I'm a couple behind. But um, I, I think it's, it's really hard for drama right now to bridge that gap. It's either a straight-up procedural, like The Mentalist or CSI, and I, I understand the pleasures of those kinds of shows, absolutely. Or, you know, Castle, I guess, is one show that does that, mm -hmm. that has, or even Bones has yeah. a little I bit of a Bones lighter tone. Bad. So I, I, that's the reason I can kind of see why those shows are, um, are, are fun, and, and, you know, and that's one reason, like, on the, at the end of the week on a Friday night, you know, I'll sit there and, you know, open a glass, open a bottle of wine and watch, you know, Burn Notice, or even occasionally something like Psych, you know, that USA has made a huge killing off of those shows that are not, that maybe have some moral gray areas, but are essentially just entertainments, and that's fine, and they're, they're trying to do that well. And I'm, I'm okay with that, because I need that sometimes, too. So um, I think definitely when you're talking about um, the kind of dramas that are looking, you know, looking at the heart of darkness and or um, playing around with the rules of what drama can be, um, part of... This, this through line that we've been on this last decade or 15 years or so um, that Alan Suckenwall writes about in his recent book is, is examining the, the worst of humanity and the worst of our instincts. And I think that you're right, that, that can be fascinating, but it can also make us really want to break. And it can it's make grinding. me want to just go find Leslie Nope and, you know, curl up with her like a blanket, you know? <laughs> or, yeah, like, but, but again, I do think that this is part of the reason that comedy's 
um, people need a relief, you know? But I also think sort of what's key to, like, the USA dramas or something like Castle or Bones is that they're procedurals with sort of what I'd almost refer to as um, emotional serialization, right? Absolutely. An episode yeah. like Bones spends much more time on, you know, Booth and Brennan, its two main characters who are both, right. you know, partners in crime solving and co-parents to a kid you know, figuring out where they're going to live or how they're going to decorate their nursery or dealing with their friends than, like, a standard law and order procedural. And, yeah. you know, yeah. the same is true on USA, where it's all case of the week, but it's a lot more, it's just a much, the amount of time and sort of plot mechanisms is, you know, maybe down to, like, 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and then, or, you know, maybe even, like, 25, 30 minutes. And then the personal stuff is 20 you know, 15 minutes of the episode. And I think that right. that's actually a really sort of smart insight for procedurals to have that, you know, I'm not sure it's been sort of fully acknowledged as an innovation. Because it's a smaller innovation, but it's still an innovation. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, one of the reasons um, Mad Men, you know, made a splash is because it did explore uh, dark things, and it got darker as it went. Certainly the most recent season was pretty... Um, it, it had a lot of really complex, but you know, ultimately um, difficult areas that it explored. And but part of the reason you can get into Mad Men is because you can look at the costumes, you can look at um, the hairdos, you can look at the, the milieu, the apartments. There's some there's some you know counterbalance to that. You know, and I guess with Game of Thrones, there's the counterbalance of just the sheer spectacle of it and the machinations of it and sort of the, uh, you know, soap opera aspect of it, where it's just you're being kind of drawn into these schemes and these uh, courtiers doing doing their worst and that kind of thing. So well, a lot of these shows have like a countervailing ethos, some, some countervailing enjoyment factor, perhaps. Walking Dead doesn't really have that. It's really just about making you scared. And Homeland, you know, too, I think maybe that's half the reason they bump up the tension or the twist is to kind of give you that visceral jolt of like a thriller would give you. Well, and I think, I mean, to go back to Mad Men for a second, Mad Men is functionally a procedural, you know, and I don't think that's acknowledged enough, but every episode it's, you know, how do we nail this pitch? How do we deal with this client who wants to sleep with Joan? How do we, you know, get this presentation to work? Um, right. I mean, it's effectively a procedural, it's just a procedural outside of the character, out of, outside of the categories that we recognize as procedurals, which are effectively medical and criminal. Um, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, the newsroom is functionally a procedural about news reporting, although it's ex the procedural part of the show is executed really poorly. Um, and I think that, you know, that might actually be a really interesting way forward for prestige dramas, if they can find a way to sort of successfully proceduralize new things in a way that like doesn't require extremely complex multi-episode Rube Goldberg devices, but leaves a lot of leaves a lot of room for character development. But I think that all these shows have like Mad Men has ongoing threads and thread of the week, and I think Breaking Bad does that too. It's got you know, okay, we need to get this particular chemical to make our meth. How are we going to do that? And then sure, that although it's generally connected to a larger enterprise as opposed to this is a standalone. But I would also argue that things that have been Mad Men are generally connected to a larger thread. You know, like we're going to establish our own agency or we're going to um, land this client. Or You know, I think probably there's many arcs within seasons with Mad sure. Men, but there's overall, there's a destination that they get to at the end of it. You know, he proposes to Megan or, you know, um, right. gets a, he's going to get a divorce or his wife leaves and whatever. So, But I think um, they are less complicated. Than I think sort of big conspiracy plots. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I mean, I'm willing to see, see where Homeland goes. Um, I very much like to show on. Um, I guess maybe I'm thinking in a little bit of the opposite way than you. But I liked Hunted a lot, which is a show on mm. Cinemax that ends this week, and that's very very serialized. It's pretty much one story about a woman going undercover to. Um, she works for corporate espionage agency, and they they are investigating or dealing with this big um, pro dam project that's going you know going to bid 
going through the bidding process and how that all shakes down because there's a lot of money at stake. Um, essentially, that's a very, very closely tied together story, but it's only eight episodes, so it's less, I think it's less wearing. I mean, to me, I don't mind mechanics if they're mechanics that pay off. And yeah, I find with Sons of mechanics. Anarchy, the mechanics are there to be mechanical. There's no space. I mean, they I take up a ton of oxygen in space, and the payoff is minimal because it's the same thing over and over. Yeah, and I think that I really do think that, um, you know, there's a difference between heavy serialization over six hours and mm -hmm. heavy serialization over, you know, 13 hours. Or, oh, yeah. you know, and Suns this season has had a lot of, you know, hour plus episodes. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, I mean, this comes back to a debate that we have over and over again, which is finding the right, you know, amount of time to tell a story in. Right. Um, and, you know, that's that's a challenge for heavily serialized shows, which, you know, I think if they were done closely tailored to the serialized story, would end up having fairly idiosyncratic run times. Um, yeah. Matt Silver I don't know if you've ever seen it, but he, wa he wrote an essay a few years ago now. I think it was around the time that the American prime suspect was commissioned, not when it came out, but before that. And it, that was an essay I've always thought about because it, it, basically what he said was what was great about prime suspect in its UK run is that they figured out the story that they wanted to tell and they figured out how big that story would be. Would right. it be and seven hours? Just, would it be yeah. four? Would it be ten? You know? And I think that's not a flexibility that American television truly has yet, although you see 10 season shows, you see 14 season shows, you see, you know, 13 episodes, but like somewhere an hour and a half. So, um, I don't know. I, I, I think that sometimes what, you ha what happens when you give a showrunner used to 13 or 22 episodes, 10 episodes, is they, they try to cram the same amount of stuff down mm. to 10. And so it's not like it always works, but hopefully with like Netflix and other providers and Hulu coming on board, you're going to see more, and obviously the rise of web series that already just kind of determine what what they're going to do and how long they need to do it. And you'll see hopefully more flexibility going forward in terms of deciding what the story is, how much space it needs, and then making it. Yeah. I mean, just because, you know, I think there are, I mean, everything we've talked about in this, you know, episode of Blogging Heads, I feel like, you know, is sort of a reason that a lot of us watch British shows, right? Yeah. There is more potential for joy. The length of the seasons varies more. Um, there's sort of a prioritization of emotion, like in, you know, down and character Abbey, exploration, or, yeah. Yeah, or straightforward, you know, good and bad as opposed to anti-heroism. And, you know, I think that, you know, <laughs> we're yearning towards a lot of those sort of flexibilities and that emotional tone. And I don't think the UK has produced a great anti-hero show yet, but they're doing really well in a lot of other areas. And, you know, Linda Holmes has this thing that she says about the golden age of television, which is that it's deep but not broad. So we've gotten really uh -huh. good at doing one kind of show, yes. but haven't necessarily cracked a bunch of other codes. And I agree. Or if we've cracked other codes, I think, you know, comedy is like girls and enlightened or seismic and fantastic, but nobody watches them. And I feel like the British Revolution has been sort of broad but not deep. Um, yeah. And so those two revolutions feel extremely sort of, con you know, um, they work together, they're important, they fit. And for those of us who are watching 20 television shows a season, the British stuff becomes a much needed palate cleanser. Absolutely. You know, it's a. Uh, it's definitely a little bit of a, of a break. And while well, I've taken up a bunch of your afternoon at this point, and I feel like on that note, I should go off and watch my screeners of the hour, where presumably <laughs> nobody will be stabbed to death or bite off their tongue. But, you know, whether or not um, Hector leaves Marnie is, has me on the tips of my toes. We'll see what yeah. happens. No, I, I think it's been really fun. Thanks for having me. Thanks for your time. Hopefully I can have you back soon. Definitely. Thanks.